Hey, I've got John Malloy here. John, thank you for coming on today. You're quite welcome. Uh-huh. I'm happy to be here, Mark. So I've known John. How long have I known you, John? It's how long you've been in the business? Um, almost 30 years. Because I preceded you into the business. I remember when you were the new kid on the block. Ah, so you've been longer than me. Well, I remember when you didn't have any kids or were married. Oh, uh, well... I was in between marriages and kids. <laughs> <laughs> and we have at least one child that is, I think, exactly the same age. Correct. Very close. So, in other words, what we can say is we've known each other for a very, very long time. And we've done business together over the years. Correct. But I don't know everything about you. And that's why I want to have you on the show. Because I want to learn not only John Malloy, who's president of Atada and you know has a big New York City gallery that deals in Native American art and contemporary art. But I want to know a little bit more about you as a person, too. Um, so tell me, where did you grow up, John? I grew up in Queens, a borough in this New York City. I would have never guessed that by your accent, that's by the way. Correct. Yeah, I've, I've worked on this accent. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I'm a New York City born and bred. Yeah, and so you born like kind of late 50s baby or a little correct. earlier? Correct, yeah. a little bit early. Yeah. Okay, so you also were kind of in that Vietnam era as well? Correct. Heck no, we won't go. Yeah, okay. Yeah, we'll get to that then. So you grew up in Queens. Correct. And um, so when did you start liking art, especially Native American art? Well, I was always interested in the arts. And uh, Native American art, I had a few epiphanies. Mm -hmm. The first thing that made me truly aware of uh, Native American peoples in a way that was not completely generalized in media subject was reading uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee. That was revelatory to me. And how old were you at that time? Uh, early 20s. Yeah, okay. And um, took a car ride to uh, California, and we stopped in Cody, Wyoming, and visited the Buffalo Bill Historical Center. Mm-hmm. At that time, it was still in an old schoolhouse. And I remember very specifically looking at a piece of art, a giant pipe bag, and saying to myself, wow, this is beautiful. In your early 20s? Correct. And so did you make that trip, Cody, just to go see the Western art? No, we were on our way to California. Yeah, but, yeah. Did, you st- but did you make the detour and go, okay, I hear this, or you just go, oh, let's go through Cody? Well, I, well, I, I don't remember the specifics oh. of it because it was a long time ago, but we, did, we went to Yellowstone, and then we went to Cody, and then we went to the Buffalo Bill. And you Historical remember Center. that pipe, and you still remember, clearly you still remember that pipe bag. Correct, correct. That have was you, the moment that got me excited about the material. Have you ever got to go back to Cody and see that bag? If well, they don't, there? they're no longer in a, a schoolhouse. Yeah. Uh, there has a couple other there, things but... on display at the time that are no longer on display that yeah. I remembered quite vividly. Uh, and it's just like if you were to go to the original Museum of the American Indian, uh, the displays were quite different than the mm-hmm. contemporary displays. Are. So when you're growing up as a kid in Queens, so you would go into New York, I'm, I'm assuming, right, and go course. to the Metropolitan, things like that. Did you do that on a regular basis? Or well, not, not on, a regu- on an irregular basis. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On an irregular basis, yes. But you knew there was something there that you liked art in some form well, or fashion. Well, you know, I really was drawn to literature and uh, theater initially, hmm. and I didn't expect that I would be an art dealer as such. Uh, I thought I would be making a living in the arts, but I thought it would be in either literature or theater. Hmm. But sometimes there are forks in the road, and we take one fork. And so, so I went to graduate school at the University of Oregon. And where did you go to? Where did you go to undergraduate school? I went to undergraduate school at Fordham University where I had the great privilege of studying with uh, Dr. Marshall McLuhan, the renowned media theorist. And he was very influential on me, uh, particularly in my view of indigenous art. And we'll get to that in a few minutes. Yeah, good. Uh, but I went to graduate school at the University of Oregon in Eugene in the MFA program. And uh, I followed a friend of mine who was out there really raved about the program. So while I was out there, we opened an antique store off campus and you're 21, 22? Well, a little bit older than that, but not too much. Still yeah. in my 20s. And um, so we opened this antique store. I was very interested in photography at the time. Another friend of mine was uh, developing an interest in Native American art. Mm-hmm. And so I became aware of that. And as you are want to do in your 20s, when your friends look into something, you look into it too. I remember going to Portland Expo and buying my first textile. What kind? Uh, it was just a Navajo rug from mm-hmm. the 20s, you know, mm-hmm. uh, paid $50 for it. You know, it's probably worth five times that and, now. And how long did you hang on to that? About 30 years. Yeah, very <laughs> good. That's <laughs> a long time. Yeah, I might still have it somewhere, yeah. I don't know. Uh-huh. Um, so that was the genesis of my interest in the marketplace. And 
I discovered then, and that's the late 70s, that it was a very active marketplace, just mm -hmm. beginning, and you could buy something that was really beautiful, and you could sell it relatively quickly and make a little bit of money. And I found that attractive. And I found the lifestyle attractive because it allowed me to travel around the country, visiting different people, learning more about the art. Mm -hmm. I was really drawn to the fact that all the different regions had different visual vocabularies. So learning the language of each region, the visual language, what really interested me and uh, was fun to learn. So you're doing your MFA in Oregon, right? Correct. And but what made you go, okay, I'm going to open an antique store? Is, what, what did your mom and dad do? Were they... No, no, my dad was a New York City fireman. Um, you know, my mom was a, a homemaker. Um, so they had never done a business, right? Correct, correct. So what? why did you go, I need to or I want to open a business? Because that's a pretty big leap, really. Well, you know, everything was so cheap then. You know, we had, there was this availability. We, had, we threw around different business ideas. You know, we were from the generation that didn't really want to do the corporate world. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for things to do. And, uh, you know, we talked about opening different types of businesses. But an antique store seemed easy because... There wasn't anything old in Eugene. The town was found in 1879. I had always dabbled a little bit in antiques mm -hmm. uh, back home, and I knew where you'd get them. And, you know, you go to a place, uh, there was a place in New Jersey, a flea market, I forget what it's called. Um, you can go there and fill up a van and drive it to Eugene and sell the stuff, you know. So and did fun. you see this as actually a business, as a not only just a business to make money to, so you could get through school, but actually a profession at that time? Not at all. Not at all. I was very interested, as I mentioned earlier, in theater and uh, literary works. And so when I went back to New York, uh, circa 1980, I worked in television and I uh, did a lot of production work and commercials. And uh, I had I worked at a couple of television stations and a couple of radio stations. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, I just gradually liked the autonomy of, of working with the arts on a dealer basis and uh, just evolved. So how long did you do the antiques thing, the the store? A couple just, of years? Yeah, a couple of years. Yeah, and then yeah. you said, okay, I'm going to go. You got your MFA, I assume? Yes. And then you said, I'm going to go back and work in my profession. And I'm, well, I mean, I, I didn't have it all thought out like that. No, you know? yeah, okay. I, I had it thought out. You're like, 25, yeah, so yeah. running around doing what I want to do. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just went moved back east because I had a daughter and uh, it was time to... Uh, for her to go to school, and okay. she was going to go to school back east. So, and so you went back, and then you did commercial. What were you doing as far as production and that uh, kind of production stuff? Production assistant. You know, I yeah. had opportunities in the field, but uh, you know, I chose to go into the art field. And so, where did that? When did you go? Okay, I'm doing this for a period of time. Now I want to get to buying and selling, or was it just an organic thing that just kind of happened? Yeah, it was pretty organic. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, same for me actually. So, right. yeah. Yeah. you know, it, it didn't. Uh, wasn't a career path I chose. Yeah. It was a career path I walked down. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that's one of the one interesting things that people find about this show is that how do we get where we are? Now, we're kind of considered to be the leaders in our field, at least for what we handle and the kind of th things that we're known for. But we didn't go into it, neither you nor I, with that as, at least I don't think you did, as that being our ultimate goal. But somehow organically you go there's a point where you flip and go okay I don't want to do those commercials material anymore I want to do something else and what when was that and how did that well, occur in 1985 I went to Europe to uh, look for Indian art and I was successful and I decided I enjoyed going to Europe so you say you were successful so where did you go just I went to London at that time I spent six weeks in London and did you just go from antique to antique store or was no that... no I got to know a few dealers and got to you know moseyed around and, and enjoyed living in London and mm -hmm. paying my way by buying Native American art which I could sell in New York so that worked out really nicely for me so for a period from 85 to say uh 2010, I probably went to Europe three or four times a year. So the lifestyle appealed to me a great mm -hmm. deal. And initially to buy and then increasingly to sell. And that was, you know, fun. So I enjoyed that a great deal. And it was probably an area that you go that you didn't have as much competition in the States too, right? And, and get earlier material well, as well? before the internet, there was very little competition. Mm -hmm. There would be a couple of people in the room. Right. You know? 
And and you at at that point you were starting to feel comfortable with your own knowledge base that you could buy because this was primarily beadwork I would assume more or less. Or well, not. whatever showed up, of course. You know, I, I mean, right. I bought a great Akamita pot in mm -hmm. uh, London once. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I saw any spectacular. There was a great basket, but Marty Striever heard about it. She bought it. Yeah, it Marty Striever just passed away Correct. last year. She was Correct. one of our leaders in the field for jewelry and pottery as well. And basketry, I think, yeah, as just well. about everything, quite frankly. But uh, so, And was she in the audience at that time? Did she come no, out? No, I think she was on the phone at yeah. the time. And uh, they did have phones then, but we didn't yeah. have the internet. <laughs> they were all dial up. They, you had to use your fingers and then went. So it's great fun to be going to Europe and, and uh, buying and selling American Indian and be completely autonomous, you know. So I didn't have a shop. I was a, a partner in Spanish and Indian Trading Company here in Santa Fe from 1989 to 2011. We moved to Santa Fe in 1994, mm -hmm. lived here until 2002, mm -hmm. moved back to New York City, um, opened a gallery, and then moved its location to its current location in 2008, just mm -hmm. in time for the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. That's when you moved back to to Manhattan? You well, yeah, we live in Manhattan, and uh, I moved back to Manhattan in 2002, but I opened the gallery in its current location in 2008. And so when you're just backtracking a little bit, so back and when you're making these trips to, to Europe every three or four times a year, did you have a business at that time? You know, like, in, in other words, were you John well, Malloy? Or well, was I was it? with Spanish and Indian Trading Company. That's what your, your business was. That was the gallery. Correct, correct. And so you, and most of the retail sales that you did at that time would have been through the Santa Fe location? No, not at all. Not? Most of the retail sales, as you know, would be through people that you meet at shows and mm -hmm. you develop personal relationships with. The people that walk in the gallery is another category. Mm -hmm. And did so, at what point did you realize that this was your profession? Because at some point you did have to make that determination, I would assume. Well, of course. Um, you know, sometime in the 1990s, I don't know that there was a particular moment, but really it began in 1985 with that trip to Europe. That was a demarcation. And I did very little television work after that, I think. You know, very little. And so, what did your dad and mom think? Your dad's a fireman and your mom's a homemaker. What did they think? Because, I mean, that's a really offbeat kind of job compared to being in a steady... Well, they, you know, they gave me the confidence to do what I wanted to they do. They did. And that's they good. supported me. And, yeah. You know, that seems strange to them, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. But they, they got it. Yeah, they're yeah. fine. They were fine with you know, it. My, you know, they, my they, dad and mom, who were research scientists, were more... When I'm giving up medicine, a little more like, really, you know, for, to sell art, you better keep that license, son. Well, my parents encouraged me to uh, get a government job when I was first out of school. Yeah. Of course, my dad worked in the government, but, uh, and my brother and sister both worked in government, but... Um, and they still work in that, in those well, fields? Well, my brother passed away last year from uh, injuries received at 9-11. Oh, wow. He was the deputy chief in the New York City Police wow. Department. Wow. And uh, my sister's an attorney who up until recently worked in the uh, state Supreme Court system. Yeah, so they did definitely go government. Right. right. Yeah. And uh, did they collect it all? Did they have the art? No. Yeah, it was for you. Now, do you feel, I mean, for me, I, I think baseball cards uh, may have been my first uh, yeah, there you collection go. and uh, first way of. Uh, Hustling a, yeah. a specific collectible. When did you When did you start doing baseball cards? When I was seven, eight, nine years uh -huh. old. And yeah. did you start buying and selling them and trading well, them? Well, so, you know, flipping them. You know, yeah. I was pretty good at that. You yeah. Know? So yeah. I think there's some natural ability for most dealers that they realize they can do that, and it feels like a natural. You know, I collected comic books and coins. That's where I right, started. Right. I think we all collected a little bit like that. Uh huh. You know? Though I kept all my comics, I still have them all. I'm waiting. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I, at this point, it feels like it would be sad to give away these things I would pay 15 well, cents for. Well, I decided for. to get rid of my, some of my baseball cards that I held on to uh, only this past weekend in Albuquerque. Wow. And I had my grandson with me, who's 10 years old, and he was selling them, and he enjoyed it, and he's a natural salesperson, yeah. so... I think we have we have somebody. Going to and go so you'd forward. had all the, you had those baseball cards since you were a little kid, little right. kid, and right. you since about 1960s kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, and you let go of them, some of them at 
this last week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because they were just in a drawer. And, yeah. How'd you and, price them? How'd you figure out how to price well, them? Something like that. Uh, I priced them at a dollar a piece, but then my <laughs> grandson priced them, he was 10 years old, at $2 a piece. <laughs> <laughs> and, and did he sell more? Uh, yeah, he did well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh, that's funny. And um, so now you, we'll just go a little bit further ahead because I find it interesting to watch your evolution personally. Um, cause you, I've seen you evolve as a dealer as well. I've always thought of you as a guy who was mainly playing speed work that you were, that was really a knowledge base and Kachinas, but you know, other things too, but those areas, but of recent, or at least it seems of recent, you've really kind of moved into contemporary art as well. Right. And well, not just this, native. No, I have this great space in New York city and uh, there's a huge audience for contemporary art and it's a limited audience for, um, Native American art in New York, and so it's... Why is that, do you think? Well, I don't know that there's any reason why. It's just that that's the way it is. I think people out west are much more aware of uh, Native Americans than people on the East Coast. There's, you know, more than 8 million people living in New York City, so... uh, But they have some great Native stuff there. I mean, they have the... Well, Charles Dyker's collection is going yeah, to be going installed to... at the Metropolitan Museum right, it's going to be on there, October 2nd in the American wing. Mm-hmm. So it's no longer going to be in an ethnographic ghetto wing on the side of the building. Yeah. It'll be considered American art, which it is. And uh, so we're all looking forward to that. And you have the museum down in Lower Museum Manhattan. of the American Indian, which, which is, is a specialized museum and is, is great, yes. So, I mean, you have good art, you have collectors there, but for some reason you don't feel like in at least... Well, there's a, there's a collector base there, but it's limited. It's and very if you small. have a gallery on the Upper East Side, uh, you're not fully utilizing it by limiting it to Native American art. And uh, by showing contemporary art, I bring more people into the gallery. I uh, can, of course, generate some income. And, uh, well, you like it, clearly. I, and I love what I'm doing, so yeah. it's great. Because yeah, I really like great. how you've curated it. I find that to be as, almost as interesting as anything I've seen, is watching the type of material that is coming through your um, emails that you send, uh, contemporary art. I mean, some of this really good cutting-edge material, too. And, well, thank you, Mark. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting to see that change uh, over, but at the same time, and I think you could probably address this, and I wish you would, there is a correlation there. Oh, unquestionably, yes. Right? I believe so, yes. And, uh, for example, we did a show uh, called Geometries that uh, brought American abstraction together with uh, paw flesh, Native American paw I remember flesh. that show. You did it here, right? Well, uh, We may have done it in New York we, as well. We did it in New York, and, of course, you know, Native Americans were using abstract color design a hundred and something years long before the mainstream culture got around to it. And, uh, you know, we just did a show, a Native American show called Two Spirit People, which featured Weewa, who was a transgender Zuni person Hmm. in 1880s and uh, finest potter in the Pueblo and, you know, the strongest person in the Pueblo as well. Born male, but living living the life. Yeah, and she was a fantastic potter. And so was yeah. Aro Oa, who was a Laguna Pata. And they were more or less contemporaries. I think we were slightly older. And um, the Laguna person went to Zuni, came back to Laguna, and started to use Zuni designs in Laguna pottery. Hmm. And so her work is readily identifiable. And, and uh, we're talking 1890s, 1910, right? Right, but well, before, yeah. Uh, Wewa died in 1896. Hmm. And... The, nice, the interesting thing about it is that these people who uh, lived the lives that we would call a transgender life today uh, were accepted by the Pueblos as a, another gender. They were considered... Completely, right? right. They were third yeah. gender, and they were called, referred to as two-spirit people because they had both female and male spirits. And they were sometimes asked to mediate between the two other genders and uh, were given a special status. And so I find that our mainstream culture is coming around to that now, yeah, 100 uh, 140 years, years <laughs> later, you know. We're not yeah. there yet, but we're coming around to it. And so these ways that Native American society prefigures the dominant society, uh, really, I find that an interesting subject. And so when you did that show, you had both the potters... Uh, pottery, yes. And then, did you have other things as well, contemporary? Well, so contemporary Native American artists who identify as LBGT. Excellent. Q. 
Yeah. Uh-huh. And so, who were some of those artists, do you remember? Well, Mona Bear, Madison Crow, Thomas Hawkins, Sheldon Raymore, and uh, Yakawi Heine, who's a Mohawk artist. And did they show up for the show at all? Oh, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And how did, how, what was that kind of experience for them and well, you, every, really? Every, well, you know, every, you know, I know most of those people, not all of them, but some of them already. And, uh, you know, everybody's really happy to have a, a show. You know, it's like mm-hmm. any, any yeah. other contemporary artist. People love to have shows. And was that well received in New York? Did it get some press? It should have, but... It should have gotten more press than it received, yes. But yeah. it was well received, yes. And so what other shows that, you're, that you've done? You had one that was, got, was considered to we be one of the best shows uh, in New York, we had right? A, we had a show last year by uh, featuring the work of... Um, uh, Teresa Hackett <coughs> and and Sherry and uh, that work um, was their work really complemented each other and uh, Hypoallergic called it one of the ten best shows in New York City last year so that was very gratifying and when people come to your gallery in Manhattan which is on the Upper East Side correct yeah really great location by the way do they most people come in do they even know it's a Native American gallery or do they go, oh, it's a contemporary art gallery, and you, know, you have some Native American material in it. Well, everybody who's exposed to Native American material is sort of wowed by it. And the second thing they say is, how much is that? Oh, that's cheap. Yeah, comparatively, right? You know, yeah, and... Right. Um, it's true. And even critics that come love the work. Love the work. They love the work. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not going to say a few things, because some people have complimented the Indian work at the expense of the contemporary work. I see. I understand. uh, A lot of it has to do with education on both ends. You know? And for so long, I think... Well, what's your experience, Mark? Because you've been showing both. uh, Yeah, I mean... I mean, you always have those individuals that look at contemporary art and say, oh, my kid could do it. Um, But they just don't know what they're looking at. Nobody says that about Native American art. No, they don't. Maybe ledger drawings. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I have maybe heard that, but even then, they understand if you put it in historical uh, perspective, as well as time and effort that goes into some of these things. You know, so we did the show here in Santa Fe last year, homage to the square, where I exhibited. Right. There was a great yeah. show. Yeah. Was it was very show. interesting to show, you know, Joseph Albers' work juxtaposed against con- antique native blankets from the 1870s to 1910. What's interesting to me, Mark, is that I've had a couple of artists whose work we've sold to the Alberts Foundation, so there seems to be an affinity between Native American work and Joseph Albert's approach, which you... Yeah, I mean, he, and, he, and he took a year off and did a sabbatical in New Mexico, um, the Albers Foundation. We actually did a book on it, and we got some of the photos from the Albers Foundation. And in two of those photos, it showed Joseph Albers uh, behind a Navajo blanket that was about 1890s, and then another one that were all Navajo blankets and rugs, basically, from about 1900, 1910, that he had taken pictures of. So he's clearly Mm -hmm. uh, exposed to those. And, of course, his wife is a tapestry artist, Mm -hmm. and um, they just did a big show, as you probably are familiar with, at the Guggenheim not too long ago, that was where they looked at the influence of architecture from Mexico, Mexico cuz right. they would I think they it's, made they like, wintered in Mexico it, regularly. I yeah, believe. so they went to Mexico 12 trips and I think New Mexico twice. So, I mean, obviously they, there was influence um, and they collected material for sure. And there's, you know, but the Navajo stuff was earlier. Interestingly, there seems to be a connection between New York art world and the New Mexico art world. Stiglitz, O'Keefe, people going back and forth. Yeah, Marston Hartley, John right. Marin, all right. these guys came and spent time. John Sloan, Maynard Dixon came, Dorothea Lang. Right. You know, it was a you know through Mabel Lujan Dodge, she you know she brought uh, all these be- you know wonderful people that were artists and literature, and there was an exposure there, no doubt. And some of the best works, in my opinion, by Hartley and Henry were both done in that 1917, 1918 time frame. Yeah, different cultures, and it's different. It's definitely a different feel when you're around Native American cultures, Hispanic cultures, and Anglo cultures all mixed in. Is, uh, is that's actually a great thing, and it's very creative. And that's one of the reasons you know, we come here every year too. Um, we're doing this podcast from Santa Fe today. Correct. Correct. Um, earlier, I mentioned that I studied with Marshall McLuhan. Yeah, and uh, he 
most would always pre preface everything by saying in the coming electronic age, well, of course, we have the electronic age now. Mm -hmm. And he would he maintained that it would retribalize our culture and in that we would change our perception of things. Marshall called media the extensions of man. So I take the subway to work every day mm -hmm. and virtually everyone has their handheld device in front of them. Nobody reads the newspaper anymore. That They check their handheld devices. And I think that that's altered the way we perceive art and perceive everything. Uh, Dr. McLuhan would talk about baseball as a literary game right. in the sense that you have fixed positions and you hit the ball and you go from one base to the next base to the next base. And he felt that uh, that game was representative of a time past and that in the coming electronic age, a game such as soccer, where everybody is everywhere and it's all mixed up at the same time, would become more popular. Now, Mark, you and I remember that we, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as soccer. No, we didn't and, have any. And yeah. now, of course, all the kids play soccer, yeah. and only a few play baseball. And partially, that could also be a worldwide phenomenon, too. Right. And again, he's right. I mean, it's media exposed because we see World Cup, right? We're all going watching World Cup. Right. And so we have an interest, and, we, and our children learn early on. And maybe you could tell us just a little bit about him, because not everybody may well, not know. Well, Dr. McLuhan wrote a book called Understanding Media. He wrote many books, and... Uh, his work really revolutionized the way uh, people thought about media. And I believe he's considered the patron saint of Wired magazine. And in 1964, uh, he said that, um, he wrote in Understanding Media, that in the coming electronic age, the industrial worker will be on a par with the savant. And of course, that's a puzzling thing. What does he mean by that? But of course, what he meant was Google. And you want to know what all the train where the trains are going to come in or what the schedule is. Or how to get to this place. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. Anybody can do it now. Yeah. Where all that knowledge was very specific and required research. Um, so part of this retribalization of culture, I think, has shifted the way that we look at things when we talk about uh, geometries, abstract art. Now it's contemporary art but we see it previously already prefigured in indigenous art. And of course, modern art, you know, Picasso went to Africa yes. to see that. So it's all very interesting. Um, and now we have somebody like President Macron in France saying that maybe all the art in the French museums should go back to, the front, uh, to Africa. And it's in this talk about the Elgin marbles going back to Greece. And of course, there's uh, some talk about some of the Native American art going back to Native American communities. Um, I don't completely understand why people think that way now. Uh, it probably also has to do with electronic media. I think um, it's a puzzling thing because it calls into question the whole idea of Western museums and uh, basically secular humanism. Do we all have a shared human aesthetic, which I think we do, and I don't think it's limited to different um, ethnicities. You know, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Well, but. yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an ever-evolving situation. I mean, as antique uh, dealers in Native American art, I think there are certain parameters that we have to respect, things that are spiritual, things that are important to the individuals from a from a uh, ceremonial point, those are things that should remain, in my opinion, with the tribes. The question is you have to have some way to delineate what those are and what aren't. And that, and that probably, to some extent, needs to come from the Native Americans to give us some guidance on that. But at the same time, most of the things that we handle, I would say almost exclusively, really are tourist based into some, or trade well, items. we're approaching 100 years of Santa Fe Indian market. Yeah. I would like to mention that Atata, the uh, tribal Right, now John dealer, is the president of Atata, which is the Antique Tribal Dealers Association. Uh, we are, are sponsoring a program called the Voluntary Return Program. Yeah, tell us about that. And we have returned over 100 objects to the Pueblos that they felt uh, or they feel are community property and should never have been sold. So over the course of the 20th century, many objects were sold by people who were caretakers, but they were actually the property belonged to the community and they didn't have a right to sell them. Um, and that's the current view. And 
So we have this voluntary return program where, I, as I mentioned, we've returned over 100 objects to uh, different Pueblos. Right. And, and the majority of the things that we uh, would consider um, objects that we would handle, in fact, for, I, would, I would say all the things that we consider that we handle, really, for Atata members, is uh, things that were more trade items or sold, literally sold to, made to be sold. Well, every Atata member agrees not to sell things that are culturally sensitive there to Native American communities. That's it. I mean, that really is the bottom line. If it's culturally sensitive, we're not going to be involved in it. Correct. And uh, nor should we. And I kind of made that my standard as soon as I started handling material at all. That I just didn't want to be involved in that kind of in that kind of stuff. And it's an evolving uh, area because it's you know. What is sensitive and what isn't is always, um, I think it evolves, and that's okay. And you need to have that dialogue. But one of the ways to have that dialogue is through Atata, I, I think. Well, Atata is definitely taking the leadership position yeah. in, this, in this conversation, correct? Yeah, and where would you like to see that go in the future? Well, I, I think that we should continue to return objects that are in the communities that were disenfranchised from, from the Native American community, often by the government. If you recall, the government used to take children from their homes. Yeah, uh, and my book that I just wrote, the Charles Bloom book, is based on that. It's called Indian School Days. The whole thing okay. is based on that. So, uh, and then, of course, to cert in certain parts of the country, uh, the Indian religions were outlawed. And, uh, you know, it goes way back to the Spanish, you know, where if you were... Uh, you were converted or you were killed. Yeah. And uh, so it's not that bad these days, and we're trying to correct some of those incorrect behaviors. And we have a uh, art market that is very separate from that, so people should realize that th these are two different things. And if you want to buy objects that are sacred to Native American communities, you can't and then the Tata sponsored event. Right. I should also mention that Tata is having its first online show uh, coming up later this month, and uh, you know the, all of that material will be vetted, and um, you know, and correct to, to buy and sell. Yeah, and I think the people in Tata, and I'm a member. I have been a member for a very long time. You know, our real interest is Native American arts. I mean, we want to promote it. Not only the material that is, you know, 100 years old, but we're also interested in contemporary art as well, like Correct. yourself. I mean, we're you're having shows for contemporary Native American artists. I represent Native American artists. Um, and there is a mixing of that. I think if you like Native American art, you like it all. And you see somebody like a Mark Winter who started off really just dealing in antique Navajo textiles has moved to where he's now run a trading post in Totalina for 20 years. Right. And he's a, you know, a very important component of that community. Well, I'm uh, very happy to be uh, in New York and be able to show, show contemporary art, both native and non-native and antique Native American art. And where do you see our business going? I mean, we're all getting older. Uh, a lot of our clients are older. Do you see a change in the people who are buying? Are you seeing millennials coming into your gallery and going, I'm interested in this? Well, there are people that come into the gallery and are turned on to it, of course. Um, you know, it's a shifting dynamic. I think that uh, ever since Star Wars, uh, you know, the whole media thing has changed. So uh, I have a 10-year-old grandson, I asked him if he ever played Cowboys and Indians, and he said, what's that? So it's a whole different <laughs> way of perceiving things, mm -hmm. and it's all good, and uh, I think Native American art is being seen for part of the larger American art community, right? and not off in some ghetto. So I think it's very healthy what this change is, and you know, we're going through it right now. Well, and I think the other area that we haven't even tapped into really, and hopefully maybe that next horizon that we can't predict, is the world. That we're starting to see more interest, I think, especially in places like Australia, Japan, New Zealand, in Native arts, because it is truly our only, you know, American art form, if you want well, to get right down to it. Well, interesting you should mention that, because I just did a show this past weekend in Albuquerque, at the Great Southwestern Art Show, I noticed that there was one Australian dealer, two Australian dealers at the show, and there must have been eight to ten Japanese people 
who were not Japanese American but clearly Japanese mm-hmm. at the show. So you're absolutely correct that there yeah, is a and greater I think, interest. Yeah, I mean, we, this is an art form that is truly American, right? You know, from the ground up. And I think as the world gets smaller and it's getting smaller very quickly, that those individuals uh, in the other countries are going to say, wow, we want American art too. Well, what really is American art? Well, in my opinion, it's Native American art. Not only what was done before, but what's being done today as well. And so what other things would you like to say? You've got a forum here. You've got a little platform with me. Anything else you want to talk about? Well, I'm just grateful to be able to have this conversation, Mark, and I appreciate the work that you're doing to bring uh, our viewpoint to a larger audience. So thank you. Yeah, no, I mean, to me, this is fun. And it's fun not only to bring it out to the rest of the you know, world and, and, the, and the people who are interested in it, but it's also interesting just to get other people's perspectives. Because if I, don't, I think if you don't get those perspectives, you don't really have a feel for what the world is all about. And, and this field, you know, again, a lot of the dealers, uh, and it's not, this show is not just about dealers, it's about artists, about collectors. But a lot of the dealers in our profession are getting older, and they have a lot of knowledge. Uh, and, you know, it can be lost so easily if somebody doesn't take the time. Well, I, I'm proud to say that my grandson, uh, John Carlo Colonello, is, uh, will be coming into the business, and he's only 10 years old. Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Very, very good. Now, is there anything um, great that you've gotten recently you just uh, got to tell me about? Well, I, of course, but I can't tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's because he's got a client for it, and he's afraid. Right, there's a show coming up. He, yeah. There's a show coming up for him, and he wants to save it for his clients, and I don't blame him. And that's one thing, uh, you know, as dealers, we love this material as much as anyone. Correct. And, um, you know, there's nothing greater than finding that wonderful piece that you've never seen before that's artistically mesmerizing or has a history on it that adds to the essence of that object. And, um, and it doesn't get, and has, you know, I've been doing it, well, I've been doing it since a kid, but it doesn't, hasn't gotten old for me yet. And I, no, I enjoy it more and more, and I'm very grateful to be able to do it. Yeah. Well, we're Native American art dealers with Atada, and we both, by the way, deal in contemporary art, too, and contemporary paintings. By the way, paintings. Mark, uh, Atada is changing its name. Oh, that's we're interesting. We're not changing the acronym but with the Authentic Tribal Art Dealers Association. Yeah, I didn't know that. When is that? Is that official It's now? in process. It's not official. It's uh, with okay. the lawyers right now. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a reason why we well, need to be Well, because of what you say is that we are more and more showing contemporary art. We don't yeah. want to limit ourselves to antique art. Well, I think that's but right. We want, also, we want to be authentic about it. So, yeah. So we're keeping and the that's acronym, smart, I believe. but we're changing the, uh, we're eliminating antique. Yeah, because I know I deal in a lot of contemporary material and I think most of the dealers in our business do uh, and so that makes sense good I'm glad to say hey, this is cutting news for me even being an Atata member well, it's not know. done yet so yeah. we're not, but the board has voted on it and it's in process yeah very good all right okay thank you Mark. John Malloy he's got a great gallery in Manhattan you've got to go see it. it's the Upper East Side uh, and John Malloy.com Malloy spelled with an O th- there you go go check it John out JohnMalloyGallery.com oh yeah don't yeah don't go to the first one, go to the second one. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, John's a good guy, uh, knows what he's doing. He's smart in his field, uh, and I'm proud to have known him for all these years. Thanks, Thank John, you, for Mark. coming. You bet. Thanks. Brought to you by Medicine Man Gallery, located for over 26 years in Tucson, Arizona, specializing in antique Native American art, early Western art, including the famed Maynard Dixon, as well as modern art. You can find everything online at medicinemangallery.com. There's over 6,000 objects to select from. Also, the Charles Bloom Murder Mystery Series, written by yours truly, me, Mark Sublett. There's six books in this series, and they follow the protagonist Charles Bloom through all the intrigue of the art world set in Santa Fe and the Navajo Nation. These can be found on Audible, eBooks, Amazon, and of course, the gallery at medicinemangallery.com.